if you want to get over your fear of speaking, you have to understand fear. You have to understand how the whole animal called fear operates and that speaking is just one application of it. So in this video, I want to break it down. I'm going to tell you why false evidence appearing real is one of the worst things that we can learn. I'm going to teach you how the way most of us approach fear and even a lot of the things that we're taught on how to get over fears does nothing more than just strengthen the fear. And finally, I'm going to teach you how to dissolve the real thing that's behind your fear of speaking. And even if you're not a speaker or you don't want to be a professional speaker, you're a leader. And if you're a leader, you have to get over whatever resistance you have to speaking so that you can be more influential. The more influence you have, the more impact you'll make and the more income you'll attract. So let's dive in and dissect this so you can get rid of this fear. Now let's dive into fear. And there are some people that don't really have big speaking fears. And if that's you, that's fine. I'm going to put it in the context of speaking because that's the program that we're in. But if you don't really resonate with having a bunch of speaking fears, then you can apply this to really anything. It's not just about speaking because we're talking about fear itself, not just certain applications. And that's one of the big reasons that a lot of people don't handle or, or don't clear a lot of their fears is because they think that the fear of speaking operates completely differently than the fear of being dumped in a relationship, than the fear of flying or the fear of um, networking or like, we think that all these fears are in silos and they're generally not. They're, they're, they're fragmented and they show up differently. So the fear of being dumped in a relationship looks completely different than the fear of networking, let's say, but we have to understand the essence of fear. And then we can apply some of the solutions to the applications of fear. And, you know, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't go after this phrase, this, this first bullet. I've never gone after it the way I thought about it this morning as I was writing up these notes. So, one of the common ways to handle fear is that fear stands for false evidence appearing real. And that's super cool and super sexy and it makes for a fantastic social media meme and it's almost useless. And the reason I say it's almost useless is because I don't know of anybody who encounters a fear and then reminds themselves false evidence appearing real and then the fear goes away. So I say it's useless because it doesn't solve the problem for people. And it's because it's this intellectual reframe. It's a cool thing. The acronym, I love acronyms. The acronym is awesome. And if we're really going to go after what fear is, then this is going to be complete BS. And the reason is because Fear is not false evidence appearing real. Fear is valid evidence producing real feelings. That's what fear is. The evidence is not false. The evidence is valid. You see people's face scrunch up in the audience. That's valid evidence. You see people yawning or falling asleep during your talk or whatever the fears are that you have. That's valid evidence. If we just pretend that the evidence is false, we're lying to ourselves. And we're just playing this game of pretend and make believe, which is not going to solve the challenge. It's not going to actually solve anything. And we have to understand that we're not playing make believe here. These are real feelings. The, the fears that we create are real, and they're based on valid experiences. So we can't just pretend, oh no, that's just fake and that's just false, and then actually handle the problem. It's not gonna work that way. Now conventional trainings, speaker training specifically, and conventional wisdom and a lot of the common conversation, what they do with fear is they just try to remove the evidence. So for instance, with speaking, let's say, 
a lot of the speaker training is to basically learn the rules and the tools so that you don't mess up. Now, what we're afraid of is messing up and then the audience reacting in some way or we feel embarrassed or we tell a joke and it, and it doesn't land and so they don't laugh, right? So if we try to figure out or try to learn the ways to do it right, what we're trying to do is avoid the evidence. We're trying to cause the evidence to not show up. In other words, we're trying to make sure that nobody falls asleep during our talk or nobody yawns during our talk or nobody checks our phone during our talk or that we don't forget anything during our talk. We're trying to get rid of the things that are wrong, that are potentially wrong. We're trying to get rid of them and we're trying to get rid of the evidence that they occurred instead of handling the feeling. So my question to you is, would you rather try to do everything you can to make sure somebody doesn't fall asleep or would you rather fix whatever's going on internally so that if somebody does fall asleep, you're still okay? Now, of course there are ways to engage a crowd so that they don't fall asleep, but I'm actually, thinking of a real situation for me that was one of my biggest fears is falling asleep uh, somebody else falling asleep during my talk and i did a talk about four years ago in costa rica and i was on fire like the, all the evidence that i was that i was looking for that i liked that people were laughing and getting in writing a ton of notes it was amazing so everything was going well there was about 100 people in the room a bunch of really influential people like i was crushing it right and i was excited about it and about six rows into the audience i literally saw a woman like this i mean she was knocked out cold not moving at all and it was pretty disruptive right because i was all excited looking around the crowd right trying to get my you know get uh filled up by the crowd and everything and i look and i and I see her and it was disruptive. It was painful to some degree. It was shocking. And I really had to manage that. It was like my, my worst fear, like being so unimportant and so boring that somebody doesn't just get up and leave. They just stay in their seat and fall asleep. I mean, it would be way better if she would have got up and left, right? Because then I could make some kind of story around that. But she just stayed right there and fell asleep and fell asleep with her head back and her mouth wide open. I'll tell you the end of that story another time, maybe later today. I don't know, another time. And, and if you ask me about it, I'll post a picture of it. Actually, I don't have a picture of it. Uh, I might post some other evidence of, uh, of that um, in the group if I can find it. But my point is, there are things that are going to happen in the audience. Even when you're doing well, there are things that are going to happen in the audience. And if you're afraid of the evidence, then you're always going to be out of control. You're always going to be worried about the things that you're seeing. You're always going to be externally focused. And that is how to become unstable very quickly. The way to be unstable is put all your awareness and focus externally and seek your validation and approval from the evidence that you're seeing outside. Because you're constantly going to be looking for evidence that makes you feel good and trying to avoid evidence that makes you feel bad. But you're going to be looking for that evidence because it's all based on the fear of actually seeing the evidence. So everything is lighting up doing it wrong. And a better way to go is actually to heal whatever needs to be healed, to clear whatever feelings need to be cleared or fears need to be cleared so that when things happen outside of you, it doesn't completely destroy you. You might get disrupted and we'll go into, not, not on this call, but later on in, this, in the program, we'll go into ways to handle what's going on around you during your talk. And there's all kinds of things to consider. But if you're internally focused and internally rooted then you're not going to be looking for all this external evidence and that's why most trainings around fear and most training specifically for speakers 
actually increases our fears of doing it wrong. So basically what we're doing is something that I call trigger avoidance. We're trying to avoid the triggers of the fear. I ask this question all the time. How many people are afraid of flying, you know, in an audience? And usually a few hands go up. How many people are afraid of heights? How many people are afraid of speaking? How many people are afraid of networking? How many people are afraid of whatever? And, you know, hands go up with, with all the questions because these are some of our more common fears. But the key here to understand is that nobody's afraid of the thing. Like nobody's afraid of flying. People are afraid of dying in a plane crash. And that's different. Nobody's afraid of heights. They're afraid of falling and getting hurt from high places. That's different. The reason this is different is because we have to separate the trigger from the outcome of the trigger. But because of the way that fear works, we try to protect ourselves. And so if we get bitten by a dog, let's say, our mind will tell us, don't go near any dogs. What we're really afraid of is not a dog. We're afraid of the pain of a dog bite. And most of the time, we're not going to get bitten by dogs. But our fear gets overgeneralized because it wants to protect us. And then we transfer. Okay, so, so if you're able to see me, watch this. We, we get bitten by a dog here, and we have the pain here, right? The bite from the dog happens first and then the pain from the dog bite happens what the brain does is it transfers the pain from the bite onto the trigger onto the thing called dog in this in this uh, case and then we're afraid of dogs and then that fear can actually become even more over generalized to where we become afraid of animals or anything with teeth or anything with four legs. We might even become afraid of anything with a mouth because we're transferring the pain to the thing that could lead to the pain. So if somebody has a fear of speaking and that fear is based on screwing up, you don't wanna screw up, here's the way you'll never screw up speaking. I have a way for you to never ever mess up speaking. Don't ever speak. That's the way to do it. That's the way the brain operates in creating the fear. It says, okay, I'm going to give us a fear of speaking so that we don't go up there and experience the thing that we're apparently really terrified of. So I'm going to protect you by not allowing you to get on the stage. How do we protect ourselves from, from feeling heartbreak? We don't get into relationships. Or if we do get into a relationship, we don't fully open ourselves up to somebody because the way that you can make sure somebody doesn't break your heart is you don't give it to them to break. So the way that fear operates, it transfers the fear from the outcome to the trigger. And then all we can do is avoid the trigger. So people who are afraid of flying, they either need to heal that fear or they can't fly because flying is the trigger. People who are afraid of falling from high places they have to not put themselves in high places. They have to avoid the trigger. And that always will put us in a place of being a victim out of control because the triggers are all around us and we can't control what other people do or circumstances in, in our environment. So the more that we put our focus on the triggers outside and then we try to avoid them or we try to pretend they're not there, the less control we have. And here's one thing that does not help a fear, less control. So if you already have a fear of speaking, let's say, and then you add less control, meaning you're trying to memorize all these rules and tools and techniques and what to do right and what to do wrong, that actually puts you in less control. It doesn't seem like it, it seems like you're learning the right thing to do. But if you understand the way fear actually works, we're giving up a piece of our control and now we're just trying to make sure that we do it the right way. And when we attempt to do things the right way, what we're actually doing is trying to make sure we don't do them the wrong way. Now that distinction sounds exactly the same, doing it right versus not doing it wrong, but it's not. It's not coming from the same place. If we're doing things right so that we don't do them wrong, 
then really we're being driven still by the fear of doing it wrong. We're not actually excited about doing it right. Hopefully that makes sense because understanding that distinction and what's the actual driver underneath the fear will hopefully help you understand why learning the rules doesn't change that we're being driven by the fear. We can learn the rules and try to change our external behaviors and actions, but we're still being driven by the fear. And all we're doing then is just covering it up. We're just trying to put on a, a, a bigger or better or more efficient uh, protection mechanism. So if we go after fear the way that most people do, it's futile because all of the focus is external and it relies on a fallacy that the triggers actually are avoidable. Meaning it relies on this crazy idea that if you do everything right as a speaker, everybody's gonna like you. Or if you get really good at telling jokes, everybody's gonna think you're funny. If you get really good at the speaking rules, then nobody's gonna get up and walk out. Nobody's gonna be checking their phone. So it operates on this false belief that if you do it right, then the triggers won't happen. And that's why it's bullshit. Because you can be amazing and the triggers are still going to happen because we're dealing with humans and we're dealing with a distracted society. Nowadays, distraction is in the fabric of our society. And we can't go up on stage and change the fact that this human being is a distractible human being. And we think that if we don't say, um, then they won't check their phone. Now, of course, nobody makes that specific connection. That's basically what we're doing. If we do the right thing, then they won't do the wrong thing. And that just constantly puts us in the state of really being a victim to other people's actions. And again, things that we can't control. Now, with speaking specifically what this means, I mean, this hit me so hard this morning as I put this sentence together. It means your audience is the bad guy. Your audience is one of your main monsters to avoid. And if your audience is your adversary, if your audience is the thing that you're trying to protect yourself from, energetically, you're screwed. Because you cannot connect while you're trying to protect from the same thing. You can't connect to the audience while you're trying to protect from the audience. But if we don't understand how to handle these fears internally, then the audience by default is the trigger. It's the place where the bad evidence gets found. And so we place our audience in a negative light energetically and we actually transfer some of our fears to the audience. And then we try to appease the audience. We try to appeal to them. We try to do the things that will make them approve of us. And in any scenario, when we're trying to do things that make somebody else approve of us, we are screwed. Because as soon as we replace one audience with another audience or a single person with another person or another person just enters the audience, now we have a new set of standards to try to get our approval from. And the same thing that works with one audience might not work with another audience. And the same thing that works with the left half of an audience might not work with the right half of an audience. So anytime that we're constantly trying to get our approval from external means, we are in big, big trouble. I already mentioned this a little bit, but I wanna take this a step further. Fear is always protection from the thing happening. But we got to understand, what would, why would we ever protect something? Why do mothers yell at their children if they're gonna, getting ready to run into the street? Why do we do anything to protect other people or things from being damaged? It's because we care. If we didn't care, if I didn't care about these walls, let's say, then I wouldn't give a damn if somebody came in and, and, and screwed it all up. We wouldn't, if we didn't care about our car, then we wouldn't 
then, then we wouldn't care if somebody like scratched it with a key. It wouldn't matter to us because we don't love or care about the thing. So this is so important to understand. Our protection in the form of fear is coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of care. We don't have embedded in us this like evil presence that really wants us to suffer. Our fears actually want us to stay safe. Our fears want us to have fun. Our fears want us to enjoy life. It's just that they've been told that going up on that stage is not the way to stay safe. So they're not trying to make our lives miserable. They're trying to keep our lives from being miserable. But they're operating with some false definitions of misery and a misunderstanding of what's actually creating the misery. So if we understand that our fear of speaking or our fear of vulnerability or visibility or whatever our fears are, if we understand that those fears are actually rooted in love and not anger, then the way that we remove them is also with love and not anger. We can't just get, get, get tough on ourselves, you know, try to do tough love with ourselves and say, well, you should be over this by now. You know this. You've been doing this for a long time, damn it. Why don't you just get over the fear already? It's only false evidence appearing real for crying out loud. That kind of conversation doesn't change people's fears because that's not what created the fear in the first place. So we have to understand everything that fear is. We have to understand where it's coming from so that we can change the way we look at it. We change the way we understand it. And then we can change the way that we handle it. We can change the way that we approach it. Now, if you like this video and you're interested in increasing your impact as a speaker, go check out that video. It's the entire first module of the Transformational Storytelling Program. Hey, welcome to module number one. I want you to freaking love speaking. And we're gonna talk about becoming a transformational storyteller and